Do you really think that's going to be helpful? How would you tell people that it's helpful? You first, first, first. How would you tell them? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hey there, YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Last time we heard from Doug Batchelor, he was about to go into what for him passes as detail about so-called living fossils. I predicted that we would hear about the coelacanth, the horseshoe crab, sharks, and maybe triops. Remember, while I do skim these videos to make sure they're worth responding to, I script these as I go. At the time of this writing, I don't actually know what he's going to say. Let's see how I did, shall we? It, well, this, to me, I think is very interesting. For instance, on the screen here, you're going to see that's a coelacanth. This doesn't count as a prediction. It was already on screen, but yes, it is a coelacanth. A coelacanth, they found these fossils in different parts of the world. They said these were ancient creatures, 65 million, based on the fossils, they say they lived 65 million years ago. No, fossil coelacanths went extinct 66 million years ago, but they are known to have existed 410 million years ago. So, you know, from the Devonian until the end Cretaceous. And the thing is that the vast majority of them did not survive to today. We have only two species in a single genus, both in deep water, unlike the shallow water coelacanths from the fossil record. And those little stubby fins they have are proto-legs. That means they would crawl along on the bottom of the seafloor and they were gradually developing legs that would someday crawl out on the land. Incorrect. Coelacanths are, like tetrapods, lobe fin fish, but they are separated from the ancestors of tetrapods by more than 20 million years before the first tetrapods. I have never been able to find anything indicating the coelacanths in particular were ever seen as directly ancestral to tetrapods, or even representative of the morphology of the ancestors of tetrapods. This supposed status of coelacanth fins as the precursors to legs is just something that, near as I can tell, was invented by creationists as a straw man of evolution. And they said they were extinct. And on the level of nearly all the families and all the genera from the fossil record, that was correct. The only incorrect bit was that the entirety of the group was extinct. Think about it like this. We know that pterosaurs are extinct, right? And that the last ones lived at the end of the Cretaceous. Now suppose that somewhere obscure, like the northern tip of Novaya Zemlya, that there were two species of closely related small pterosaur that still existed. Does that change anything really about the extinction of all the other pterosaurs? No, it just means that one lineage managed to cling on throughout the Cenozoic until today, and they lived in out-of-the-way places that didn't result in much in the way of a fossil record. Also, it's hard to see what about the survival of such a small group of pterosaurs in the middle of nowhere would constitute a problem for evolutionary biology. Nothing in evolution demands that any given lineage go extinct at a certain point. Coelacanth, it is kind of a primal looking fish, but you see that's the artist rendering on the right there. On the left, you see someone swimming with a coelacanth. That's because in 1928, they found a living version of the coelacanth. Well, a dead one was found in a fish market, but yeah, it was freshly dead, indicating an extant population. So this is a fairly minor mistake. In the waters off of South Africa, and they found that they're still very much alive. They just had not caught them before. In fact, they had been caught for a long time, presumably millennia. It's just that Western biologists hadn't known about it. This is actually pretty common. Locals in an area are usually more familiar with the flora and fauna than foreign biologists. So when a biologist discovers a new species, really they're just formally describing a species known to locals. But it's the first time that the species is entering the scientific literature. They live in very deep oceans, and they don't do very well when they bring them up. I can't seem to find anything to back up the idea that they die in shallow water, but that is something that happens to many, but not all deep sea species, so it's perfectly plausible. So you try to get them to walk, they don't like that at all. They die when you bring them up, because they're not used to the, the low pressure. And 65 million years, and they still have not gotten those feet worked out yet. Ah, you see, this is a profound misunderstanding of evolution. This objection presupposes that evolution is orthogenic that there is some biological destiny that causes lineages to evolve in a particular direction independent of selection. A famous example of this idea is that brontotheres had this orthogenic trend to bigger and bigger head ornamentation, and that eventually it just got so big and crazy that they couldn't handle it and went extinct. Of course, we know now that evolution is not orthogenic, and there is no inexorable force reducing the digits of equids or forcing all open fish to develop legs for terrestrial locomotion. There is no reason for a deep-sea fish in the coelacanth's niche to develop terrestrial legs, so there's no surprise that they didn't. But also, they weren't doing that for more than 340 million years. They do appear in the fossil record, while other animals were, you know, fully terrestrial, like dinosaurs and mammals. Evolution no more says that coelacanths must evolve legs than that they must go extinct. I mean, just even a child could do the reasoning on this. That doesn't make sense. When they, they have all these theories, 
I'm not even sure what part isn't supposed to make sense about late surviving coelacanths. They haven't changed 65 million years. They have changed, though. There are no fossil coelacanths that are morphologically identical to the modern coelacanths in genus Latimeria. Sure, they haven't changed as much in the last 66 million years as, say, the lineage leading to humans, but there's also no minimum rate of morphological change in evolution. Further, evolution also occurs at the biochemical level, and there's no way to check to see if they have evolved in that way in the last 66 million years, since we don't really have access to ancient coelacanth biochemistry. In fact, no living fossil is completely identical to the ancient members of the group to which it belongs. As they say sharks. The only thing about sharks today is they're smaller. Uh... No. <laughs> First, called it with sharks, so yay. Anyway, here's Xenocanthus, a mostly Triassic shark. Does that look like a modern shark? I don't know too many sharks with a dorsal fin that runs their whole back, a head spike, a spade-shaped caudal fin, or big splay pectoral and pelvic fins. How about Cicanthus? I'm not aware of any modern sharks with a dorsal fin that looks like an ironing board. Are you? They used to have a shark called Megalodon. Picking Megalodon as the ancient shark to demonstrate a lack of morphological change in sharks is just cherry picking. That shark went extinct less than 4 million years ago. In terms of shark evolution, it is a modern shark. Just one that went extinct. Bigger than any great white shark. And yeah, I've, in my drawer, I've got a Megalodon tooth. They are some of the most common fossils in the world, so that's no surprise. That uh, Nathan knows what I'm talking about. Ancient petrified shark tooth. Looks just like sharks today. Well, not really. They look most like the teeth of a great white, but even ignoring the size difference, there are other differences. But even if there weren't, remember, Megalodon is basically a modern shark. This isn't some Devonian basal shark we're talking about. They're just bigger. Everything changed when the environment changed. Again, since Doug has indicated that the change corresponded to the KPG event, which I'm assuming means he thinks that that's the flood boundary, then the entire fossil record of the Megalodon has to be post-flood, which means it was around after this change. So what actually changed then? Clearly not something that would uh, disallow giant sharks, since this giant shark lived after that change. And further, what about this change would be a problem for Megalodon, but not, say, a whale shark, which is an extant shark that can grow up to 10 meters in length? Megalodon is estimated to have reached a maximum length of 10.2 meters. Did those last 20 centimeters really make the difference? I don't know. Doug here hasn't even described what about the world he thinks changed aside from oxygen. But if it's not a problem for the whale shark, I don't see why current oxygen levels would be a problem for Megalodon. Hey, the horseshoe crabs, I think, is the next example I've got. Nice. Called it again. There you've got horseshoe crab on the left. You've got a fossil. They say 100 million. You know how long a million years is? Yes, it's like 31 quadrillion, 556 billion, 952 million seconds. 100 million years old. 100 million years. Why have those horseshoe crabs... Do you know you go to the... How many of you have been to the Atlantic coast and seen the horseshoe crabs that crawl up on the shore? Finish your thought before moving on, dude. Oh, we used to see them when I lived in New York City. This guy, you flip them over, they're scary looking. Oh no, the underside of a horseshoe crab has a bunch of legs and some mouth parts. And all these little things start grappling in the air with little claws and pincers on them. And they have not improved their appearance in a hundred million years. And yet somehow they still survive. I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Is he implying that something about evolution is supposed to make animals appeal to the human sense of aesthetics? That's definitely not true. You would have thought the other creatures would have just killed them off because they're so ugly. I think this is just a joke, but this guy is so stupid I really can't tell. In case you need it said, no... Animals do not get killed for being ugly as a general rule. They still, they, you know, they say, if you want to know what a primitive eye is, the eye is so complex. Then you should look at a flatworm or a nautilus. Most of what's coming into your brain is coming through your eye right now. And they've got what they call a primitive eye. How come their eyes have not gotten any better? All they can do is kind of see light and darkness. Hundred million years! Well, first, if they're doing pretty well with that, then why would they spend resources on fancy eyes? Many organisms do just fine without eyes at all. Evolution isn't a wish-fulfillment machine for humans. But further, horseshoe crabs can do more than just detect light and dark. They can detect conspecifics at a distance, which they may use to find mates. Now, they don't have great eyesight, but other than mate detection and basic predator avoidance, none of their behaviors seem to depend on sight. So there's no need for them to have great eyes. Eyes are developmentally, neurologically, and metabolically costly. And as we can see in cave-dwelling species, if you don't need them, they're a detriment to keep around. Horseshoe crabs have kept eyes that are only as good as they need them to be, just like the Nautilus with its pinhole camera eyes, or the flatworm with its photosensitive bits of skin. It's just not logical to me. Well, that's the least surprising thing I've heard in a while. Doug is a willful idiot, and his incredulity over basic facts of science does nothing to argue against those facts. 
I think the only logical explanation is the miracle of creation. Ah, yes, because Doug doesn't understand the basics of evolution, we should just replace it with magic. I'm sure that'll fly with all the biologists out there who are spending their lives actually trying to uncover the facts about life on Earth, and who are making great strides. Some idiot from the USA finds their work confusing and it hurts his fifis. Time to just toss out science, I guess. And it's not just biology. Young Earth creationism requires us to toss out most of science, from astronomy to chemistry to biology to geology to nuclear physics. It's hard to think of a science that wouldn't have to be basically ditched wholesale to accept Doug's ideas. It sure is a good thing that actual scientists don't give a single flying f about what Doug finds confusing. Now, then I want to explain, I do believe in evolution. I find that hard to believe, given that he can't even approach a reasonable understanding of it. But lest someone stop the tape right there, let me explain. I believe in what you call micro-evolution. Oh, I guess we're leaving living fossils behind. Okay, well, just for funsies, here's Luna Taspis, a primitive horseshoe crab in which the hind section is still fully segmented, putting the lie to the idea that the group has not had morphological change during its history on Earth. Anyway, as for microevolution, I bet he's going to misdefine it, and that he actually believes in macroevolution under the actual definition used in evolutionary biology which is the only definition that matters when discussing evolutionary biology, which is the topic of this talk. We see examples of microevolution all around us. That's true. If you look at the person next to you, you will see examples of microevolution. No, you won't, because like all evolution, it is a phenomenon that affects a population over time, or diachronically, if you will. Just looking at individual members of a population synchronically will show you variation, but not any kind of evolution. You actually have to track the changes in a population over generations to see evolution of any kind, meaning that in a human lifespan, it's hard to see much microevolution at all in humans. Now, much of the variation in humans has arisen through microevolution, so you can see the results of it, but that's not the same thing as seeing the process itself. Microevolution is where the rabbits, the common hare that is living out in the desert, after a few generations, for some reason, God has designed their DNA for survival reasons. They will develop brown fur where they can melt into their environment. I'm melting! Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! And you will have a hair. It is still a hair. And it will be up in the Arctic, and it will have white fur so it can blend into its environment. You will see great diversity of species that have evolved within their species. That was a little muddled, but yes, microevolution is evolution within the species. I'm rather surprised he got that right, but I also worry that that means he will deny speciation. And on the picture here, I put as an example, Exhibit A, of what we would call microevolution, is look at the incredible variety of dogs. Most, uh, think about it, just think about it. Okay, I'm thinking about it and wondering if a wolf could evolve into a pug, what makes him think that humans and chimpanzees can't share a common ancestor? That's a whole heck of a lot less morphological change. Dogs. Yep, dogs. What about them? You know, I remember when I was growing up, we almost well, never saw to tell a them stories that don't go anywhere. Like the time I caught the ferry over to Shelbyville, I needed a new heel for my shoe. So I decided to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So I tied an onion to my belt. Which was the style at the time. Now, to take the ferry cost a nickel. And in those days, nickels had pictures of bumblebees on them. Give me five bees for a quarter, you'd say. Now, now I see them we? almost everywhere oh, I look. Yeah. I think they have been, they was, been mass bred. Um, you got little when bitty dachshunds. See that poor little dog there? It looks like a little idea. mouse next to a Coke can. And then, you know, one of the tallest dogs in the world lived up in Grass Valley. It was called Gibson. Died recently. It was a Great Dane. She took him around, and we, we saw him a couple of times. Eight feet high when he stood up. Do you know they got horses that are smaller than dogs? I did know that, yes. Well, the smallest horse is bigger than the smallest dog, but the biggest dogs are bigger than the smallest horses. And then they got Clydesdales. They got dogs with no hair. Back to dogs, I guess. No more horsey time. This guy just can't stick to a topic, can he? I'm going to wait for him to get to a point. And they say that they can trace the DNA of every dog in the world back to two original dogs that were probably very wolf-like. Dogs are still genetically extremely similar to the gray wolf. In fact, they're in the same species. You notice that in the wild, the dogs, like the coyotes and the wolves, they fared pretty well. Hold up. We just skipped like four minutes of talking about breeds of Canis lupus familiaris as examples of results of microevolution, which is reasonable. 
but now we're jumping to other species. That's macroevolution. I thought he had the right definition of microevolution. Does he just not know that there's more than one species in the family Canidae? In the original dogs, Noah did not take on the ark a dachshund and a Maltese and a German shepherd and a St. Bernard and a beagle and a Yapsu Apsu and all the other dogs. He didn't take, he took two dogs. So two dogs, two wolves, two red foxes, two fennec foxes, two coyotes, two golden jackals, two maned wolves, two doles, two painted dogs. Is that what we're going with? That is certainly interesting. It raises some serious problems for space in Noah's Ark, and is at odds with what every major and most minor creationist ministries say. Let's let him cook. And look at all the variety of people. You can show the next slide. Oh, okay. We're not going to elaborate on that. We're just going to switch to one species of primate. This talk is going to give me whiplash from all the sudden topic changes before the previous topic is even resolved. You can show the next slide. In the world that we see today, how many people did they all come from? That's a really weird question, but there's good reason to think based on paleogenomics and human genetic diversity that at a minimum, humans were reduced to tens of thousands of individuals. So I guess like 10,000 minimum. Adam and Eve, and then once again from everybody that was on the boat, on the ark. No, the idea of all human beings coming from only one pair of humans some 6,000 years ago is literally impossible given the current diversity of Homo sapiens. We can measure the substitution rate for both the Y chromosome and mitochondria, which is how you'd go about determining this, and it's orders of magnitude too slow for humans to have originated only 6,000 years ago. Further, no part of the genome coalesces that recently, not just the non-recombining parts. This really is just a matter of measurement, and the measurement says that creationists are off by at least two orders of magnitude on this one. And look at all the variety. I could go around the world today, you know, because I've traveled quite a bit, and I can go to the different islands of Polynesia, and I can see the differences between the Fijians and the Samoans and the people from New Guinea and the Aborigines. And hooray, Doug has unlocked the recognizing gross morphological differences in con specifics achievement. It's just because of the breeding and the genes, different traits become dominant. Uh, no, dominant traits don't become dominant. They're inherently dominant because of the details of how they work biochemically. But I think what he means, but doesn't know enough to express clearly, is that different traits become fixed in regional populations, such that all members of that population have the trait as a result of them having the alleles that produce it. So I believe in microevolution. But what you do not see is something that is half dog and half cat. I mean, except for Measis, which has the morphology predicted for the common ancestor of cats and dogs, and lived around the time such an ancestor would be expected based on molecular clocks. Damn. You do not see crossing happening be between the types. What, in modern, greatly diverged groups? Yeah, of course not. That's kind of how evolution works. Saying that evolution is fake because reproductive isolation is a real thing is kind of like saying the Bible is fake because King Darius was real. I'm sure the biblical scholars in my audience will understand that one. That doesn't happen. And the Bible says God made each one after their kind. We would say species. Okay, so yeah, I guess he does think that kind is at the species level and not at the family level. But the problem is that humans have observed speciation in real time. So we have seen things go from one kind to another by this definition. We have seen it in primroses, fruit flies, house flies. We're now seeing it in apple maggot flies, worms, and bacteria. Seeing it in large animals with long generation times is harder to do, but fundamentally they follow the same rules of biology as worms and flies. You'll have great diversity among the species, but the species do not cross. Even if he means contemporaneously, that's not true. Mules, tigons, ligers, and many other cross-species hybrids exist. In the fossil record, there is no evidence of the transitional forms between species. Horseshoe crabs are still horseshoe crabs. And this is what they see in the fossil record as well. Well, you know what time it is. Oh, 
So there are missing links. I mean, yeah, of course, not every single link in the history of evolution of all species are currently known. In order for that to happen, every single species would have to not only have been preserved as a fossil, but humans would have had to have already found every single species that has ever been preserved. We know both of these things are not true. The second is especially obvious because new fossil taxa are described nearly every day. This is like saying that you don't believe that someone's childhood photos actually show them growing up because there isn't 24-7 video footage of them for their entire life like they're the star of the Truman Show. Um, the, tr their, the transitional forms between the different creatures are still missing. Except when they're not. You know, you've seen the textbooks where they've got the you know, monkey walking on his knuckles and then slowly he starts to walk a little more on his feet and he gets more and more erect until you got homo erectus and he man is standing up and he's got the normal gait. And, and they show all these things in the illustration of the books. But, you know, the creatures, the, the fossil evidence in the transition between the monkey and the man does not exist. That's just a straight up lie. While I do not like the March of Progress illustration because it depicts the evolution of humans too orthogenetically, all the animals on it are known animals, and far from all the animals we have. It lists Dryopithecus, Oreopithecus, Ramopithecus, Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon, and modern man in the short version. But there's also Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Homo noledi, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, Sahelanthropus chinensis, Australopithecus anamensis, Australopithecus barogazali, Australopithecus diarmida, Australopithecus garhi, and more. The March of Progress couldn't fit all of these reconstructions in one picture. You'll see in that Time magazine on the cover, you see how there's particles of bone, and then they fill a lot in with epoxy and resin. Let me give you a little uh, practical input into how some of these supposed missing links are found. First of all, there is no complete skeleton of any missing link that they found. None. Zero. Yeah, complete skeletons basically don't exist in the fossil record. But combine the bilaterally symmetrical nature of apes with the fact that we have multiple specimens for most hominin species, and that there are biomechanical constraints on skeletons, and we know that the reconstructions are reasonably accurate. In fact, you can think of the reconstruction as a hypothesis, and when new finds are made that fill in what was once just inferred, they tend to more often than not confirm the reconstruction as plausible. Plus, you can't simply hand wave the transitional nature of a skeleton that is evident in the parts that scientists have actually found by complaining about what is missing. If someone finds a femur that is intermediate between a basal ape and a modern human, like the femora of Australopithecus africanus, you can't simply dismiss that by saying, ah, but what were the lacrimal bones doing, hmm? Not supposing we don't have Africanus lacrimal bones, which I don't know if we do, nor do I really care if we do or do not. It's just a bone I picked at more or less random. Don't at me. They find pieces of bone. You will have an expedition working in Africa. They are being funded by a university or some private supporter or some deep pocket, and they are digging looking for evidence of human evolution. And finding it. And of course that's what they're paid to do. Who would pay someone to just dig around in the rocks of Africa for fun? This is such a weird complaint. No one complains that people pay for research into new treatments for diseases because that research actually sometimes turns up new treatments. Nor is the fact that research set out to find new treatments good reason to suspect that the treatment doesn't work. Research requires the use of scarce resources, including fuel, time, chemical reagents, food, water, space on transport vehicles, etc., etc., etc. Like it or not, the most efficient ways humans have figured out to distribute such things is with prices that, while not perfect, roughly signal how valuable resources are, and if you want to use them, you generally have to pay for them. This isn't really time to talk about the tragedy of the commons, but yeah, if you want research done, someone is going to have to foot the bill. And the fact that creations don't like the result of the research and therefore reject it is a problem with them, not the research. And if they don't produce something, their funding dries up. No, funding is usually guaranteed for the duration of the research project because grant proposals are designed to seek the funding actually required to conduct the research in most cases. So when those proposals are approved, the funding is going to last until it's up, no matter the results. Now, if an avenue of research never turns up results, then sure, new grant proposals for such research will usually be rejected. But that's also true in evolutionary biology. No one is funding research into the origins of hominins in Europe because scientists check there and it turns out they failed to find any. This again is perfectly normal and normally creations don't complain about it when the research is into something that they don't feel they need to object to. They are extremely motivated to find something. Wow, this just in. People who decided to spend their lives researching a topic are motivated to research that topic. Stay tuned for more Galaxy Brain Insights from Dougie. And so when they find any kind of ancient gorilla bone which has never happened, despite people looking for them. Orangutan bone. Actually, a fair few orangutan relatives are known in the fossil record and are described as such in the literature. 
They will get epoxy in an artist. They become very creative and they say, well, you know, there's a little difference here in the skull shape. We think this was a transition. And they start to put it together and they hire an artist and they draw pictures about what Mr. Mr. Lucy and Mrs. Lucy and all the little Lucys look like. And Clearly, this is a man who never actually read a paleontology paper. Because while they do hire artists to make reconstructions, the conclusions they reach are always based strictly on what bone is actually there. The reconstructions are just a nice add-on, but the meat of the paper is all the photographs and sketches of the actual fossil material, less any reconstructed bits between them. That's also why our definitions of first species in the fossil record are based on the features that can be actually measured in the fossils themselves. It's pretty rich for the guy who has gotten basically everything factually incorrect for the past hour or so of this talk to accuse scientists of basing new species on their own artistic work and not the data. I, I gotta be very careful about how I say this, but... Odd. He generally has not shown a tendency to be careful in what he says. It seems more like this has been a long stream of consciousness in which whatever seemed true because of his intuition and previous religious conclusions is just assumed to be true. I mean, this man said that there were no ferns in Siberia, yet if you Google Siberia fern, a species of fern native to Siberia, Alaska, and northern Canada is literally the first thing that pops up. If you look around in the world today, you're going to find, even in this room, people with all different shaped skulls. Now, don't look. <laughs> Could make someone feel self-conscious. Cool. Find me a modern human skull as prognathic as that of Australopithecus afarensis. Or with the occipital bun of Homo neanderthalensis. Or even who just doesn't have a chin, like all non-H sapien species of hominins. You won't. That's because the fossil hominins are outside the range of morphological variation in Homo sapiens overall, even if there is some overlap in some characteristics. To pull from an earlier example of this, this is like saying that horses and dogs are really the same animal, because they overlap in size. It's ludicrous. Some people, we got different foreheads and different eyebrows and different sizes, and some people are tall and some people are short. And that does not mean when they find one of these, even among gorillas, they find incredible diversity among the skull shapes. Hey, Doug, if you ever watch this, I want you to know that you're allowed to finish your sentences. In fact, it's encouraged. And even among humans, they patch it together. They call it what they want. They say, we found the missing link. They haven't. We have complete skeletons of dinosaurs. We absolutely f do not. The most complete dinosaur fossil I can find evidence for is a specimen of Triceratops called Hordus the Triceratops, which is housed in the Melbourne Museum and is about 85% complete. Most dinosaur finds are fragmentary, with a few long bones, maybe a few vertebral centra, a few ribs, things like that. I routinely see dinosaur paleontology papers describing a handful of bones. It must be so easy to be a creationist. You can just make up any old bullshit, and as long as it sounds like it supports the dumbest version of Christianity, people will just lap it up like a dog drinking water on a hot Arizona afternoon. Within a certain species, many of the dinosaurs, complete skeletons. By many, he means none. There is no complete skeleton. If, if man has been around for the millions of years that they tell us, then how come we can't find... One complete skeleton. We just find these little pieces and a lot of imagination, and they create it. Um, because complete skeletons basically don't exist in the fossil record. But again, conclusions about fossil taxa aren't drawn from reconstructions. And further, the most complete hominin fossil is Littlefoot, or STW573, which is about 90% complete. You might notice that that's more complete than the most complete dinosaur. So this supposed paradox doesn't exist. The hominin fossil record is better preserved than any family of dinosaurs. We're just still making things up out of thin air. It's just not there, friends. Um, and by the way, just because they find bones in a cave doesn't mean that cavemen lived millions of years ago. You're looking at someone who lived in a cave, and here we are in the 21st century, right? <laughs> so, Well, first, most hominin fossils aren't found in caves, but those that are are dated using objective methods, such as radiometric dating. They aren't just assumed to be some age based on the whim of researchers. For example, Australopithecus sediba, which was found in a cave, was dated by both paleomagnetism and uranium-led dating, and both independent methods return an age of approximately 2 million years. Just because they find doesn't mean everyone... There were people living in caves the same time they had people building pyramids. There are people living in caves right now. Everyone knows this, and it's not an argument for or against anything, because no one is assuming the age of a fossil based on the bare fact that it was found in a cave. Doesn't mean one evolved from the other. There are people that live in very sophisticated cities today, and there are people who live in caves today. Yeah, and does Doug think that this fact is lost on paleoanthropologists? I assure you, they're aware of this. 
but I think he's just going to ignore actual dating methods because if he acknowledged them, that might bring up some unwelcome nuance. Same time in history. Yup. Well, some say, well, because there's similarity among species, and there are certain similarities among species, that means that they all evolve from a common source. This man has never heard of a Segway. Now, I've just put a picture up here on the screen. You've got a, uh, a Corvette. A Corvette, and a bunch of other things that don't reproduce with variation. So we're not going to bother. I'm simply skipping the dumb analogy, because if I had to point out in detail why comparing the features of living things, which we've never seen designed and which reproduce with imperfect heritability, to non-living, non-reproducing man-made objects which we have seen designed, again, I'm going to claw my own eyes out. Why do you find similarities between people and monkeys and dogs and cats? There are certain things they have in common, no question about that. Well, it depends. In many cases, it's because of the constraints of the environment. For example, humans and chimpanzees are both tool-using and tool-creating omnivorous diurnal apes that live in social groups. As a result, yeah, some of the similarities can be seen as probably being the result of physical necessity. Similarly, dolphins and sharks have a similar body shape because both need to swim fast, and having a fusiform body is the best way to do that. It's also why the same basic shape occurred in ichthyosaurs. On the other hand, there are similarities that are not explained that way. For example, why would all monkeys, humans included, have the same breakage in their gulo pseudogene? Even if none of them typically need to synthesize their own vitamin C, there's no reason other than common descent for all of them to have a gene that would allow them to do so, be broken in all of them in the same way every time. Similarly, they all have the remnants of ancient viruses in their genomes. This is what are called endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs. Surely, nothing about the environment dictates that humans and chimpanzees must of necessity have been infected in both species past by the exact same virus in the exact same place in their respective genomes. Further, there's no good reason their genomes should be so correlatable in the first place. There's nothing special about the architecture of either the chimpanzee or the human genome. Yet every single chimpanzee chromosome maps directly onto a corresponding chromosome in the human genome, except that two chimpanzee chromosomes directly map onto one human chromosome in one instance. And in that one instance, the human chromosome has the clear and unmistakable hallmarks of having fused from two chromosomes that would have each mapped directly onto one of the two chimp chromosomes. None of this can be explained by similar needs imposed externally, and they only make sense in the context of common ancestry. Sure, you could say that maybe God just made it that way to trick us, but I don't think Doug is going to say that, so I won't address it here. If he does make such a silly claim, don't worry, I'll talk about it. Because they were made by the same God. He said, I think I'll make one with a little difference this way. And, you know, I'd like to add this. This creature, I'll make it different, but some similarities I like. I'm going to add that and this and make this. And Then when we see different designs, can we infer different designers? For instance, did a different God make the bat wing, the bird wing, and the pterosaur wing? I mean, they're all doing the same basic thing, generating lift and thrust. And they're all even four limbs. Why are they so radically different in a way that makes sense in terms of evolutionary contingency, but that doesn't make any sense in terms of common design? What's the reason God could not simply have given all flying tetrapods a standard wing? It's because evolution is true, that's why. And they all live in the same environment. We need systems to propel ourselves, so we all got legs or fins or wings. You know, it's amazing to me. It's amazing to me that he can look at vastly different fins of a whale and a carp and think that's common design, when the internal structure is almost completely different. Flying fish? Which actually don't fly, but instead glide, and have their wings designed in yet a fourth way that matches none of the other wings in nature. So I guess now we need to add yet another designer. And here I thought Christians considered themselves monotheists. God made fish that kept jumping out of the water so long that after millions of years they developed aerodynamic design? Fins are automatically at least a bit aerodynamic, because the difference between aerodynamics and hydrodynamics isn't really all that great. Air is basically just a much less dense medium and the basic principles of drag, lift, thrust, and gravity all still operate in both media. Further, flying fish use their gliding ability to avoid waterbound predators like sharks. And so if leaping becomes the main predator evasion strategy of a species of fish, they are under strong natural selection pressure to improve the lift already provided by their fins. And this explains why they have what are essentially wings, but wings unlike any other wings, which is not what you might expect from a designer who can simply bolt on previous designs, like a pterosaur wing, onto a fish. If special creation were true, we should see chimeras. We do not, therefore the hypothesis is probably not true. No, oh, I'm being facetious, please. Of course he's being facetious, the one time that he makes the most sense. That checks out. But the idea that there are fish that fly? Which, strictly speaking, is a false idea. There are... They don't really fly, they glide. They don't flap. That's true. But they glide a long way, I've seen them. They're squirrels! 
that also glide and use what creationists might call half a wing to do so. So if he at some point asks what good is half a wing, I'll be referring back to this. That fly? Again, no. Why do some fly and others don't? Contingency. Some squirrel species had mutations that increased their aerodynamic ability, and it was advantageous. Some didn't. The ones that didn't, don't glide. The ones that did, do. We can see this contingency in evolution in the Lenski long-term evolution experiment. In this experiment, Escherichia coli bacteria were put into a solution of water, sodium citrate, glucose, and a few other things, like thiamine and ammonium sulfate. We're really only concerned with the glucose and the sodium citrate right now. Glucose was intended to be the primary source of calories for the experiment. One of the primary characteristics of E. coli is that they cannot metabolize sodium citrate in the presence of oxygen, that is, in an aerobic environment. The citrate in the flask the bacteria are grown in contains 0.417 calories. The glucose contains only 0.0005 calories. This is based on a calorie density of 1.67 calories per gram of sodium citrate and 4 calories per gram of glucose, and that the former is included at one quarter of a gram, and the latter is included at 125 micrograms, which is the standard amounts in the DM25 growth medium used in the 500 milliliter flasks in the Lenski long-term experiment. Clearly, if the bacteria could access this, it would be a huge boost to their fitness, but only one line of bacteria have developed the ability to exploit this resource. Why is that? Well, it required a series of mutations, each of which is unlikely on their own, and all of which occur stochastically, so only one lineage was lucky enough to get the right mutations. It's possible some other lineage might develop this ability later, but it's been thousands of generations, and so far, only one has. That means that such amazing feats of evolution are possible, but not guaranteed in any lineage. Similarly, contingency means that some squirrels will develop gliding abilities, and others won't. Evolution has both random and non-random aspects. Normally, creationists like to ignore the non-random aspects so that they can use an argument from incredulity about how they don't think randomness could create the world around us all on its own, which is also a straw man argument in addition to being an argument from incredulity. So that's a fun double fallacy. Doug Batchelor here is instead ignoring the random parts and expecting evolution to be 100% predictable with all members of a group evolving in the same way as if there were no contingency in evolution. Remember, evolution has both stochastic and deterministic factors, and ignoring either means you will misunderstand it. There are snakes in Indonesia that jump from trees and they can flatten their rib cage and glide. Yep, it's pretty cool. They got frogs that will spread out their toes and fly. Well, like the snakes, it's gliding, and it's Wallace's flying frog, a species I've mentioned here on the channel before. I'm glad he knows so many examples of half wings. Other creationists should take note. But what's really amazing to me is the birds that fly. Well, unlike the previous examples, they do in fact fly. Now, you've heard me say many times, I'm a pilot. I don't remember that, but, um, okay. So I don't know everything, but I know a little bit about aerodynamic design and what's required in order to achieve and to maintain. It's important to maintain flight when you're pilot and what's needed for that. The idea that lizards could just keep running off cliffs and somehow, before they crashed on the bottom, develop something aerodynamic and hollow bones and feathers and pass that on to their offspring. You can give me billions of years and I just can't see any scenario where that would happen. I also can't believe that, and fortunately, that's not what anyone believes. So here he stepped a bit into my arena. So let's do this. First, birds are indeed reptiles, but they are certainly not lizards. Lizards are one group of lepidosaurs, a group that includes ichthyosaurs, spinodonts, lizards, and amphisbanians. Now, it's not clear if amphisbanians are lizards or not, and they are poorly studied. So if later it comes out definitively that they are lizards, I don't want to hear that I was wrong to list them separately, because I'm making the caveat now. On the other hand, birds, being dinosaurs, are archosaurs, a group that includes crocodilians, adosaurs, dinosaurs, and pterosaurs. Living archosaurs are basically only crocodilians and birds, and living lepidosaurs are basically only sphenodonts, lizards, and amphisbanians. Within archosauria, there are two big groups, Pseudosuchia and Ornithodira. Crocodilians are in the Pseudosuchia group, and dinosaurs and pterosaurs are ornithodirans. Ornithodirans are characterized by an upright stance with acetabula or hip sockets that face out to the side, superficially similar to the way mammals carry their limbs. Now, for numerous reasons, birds are within dinosauria, but we'll list some of the major factors that define dinosaurs that are present in birds. First and foremost is the open acetabulum, which is to say that rather than a cup, their hip sockets are a ring of bone with an opening you can see right through. Interestingly enough, creationists like to lie about this fact whenever they discuss the bird-dinosaur connection. Second is that birds have three or more sacral vertebrae, often far more. Third is that these vertebrae are firmly attached to the hip. Fourth is that their fourth trochanter, the femur, is asymmetrical. And just having such a trochanter is itself a diagnostic trait of archosaurs. There are others, but those are sufficient to establish birds as dinosaurs, and I don't really want to get too far into the weeds. Now, feathers are actually something that evolved early on in dinosaur evolution. 
It's possible that even the furry covering of pterosaurs is homologous to the early dinoclaws protofeathers that can be seen in some dinosaurs. Anyway, the development from scale to feather is just a change in the expression of the same genes that make scales, and scales, feathers, and mammal hair are all developed from the same embryonic structure, i.e. placodes. In fact, alligator embryos can be induced to develop filaments instead of scales. Now, the flapping motion of bird wings is essentially the same as the prey capture motion allowed by the arms of their closest non-avian dinosaurs, the Manoraptorans. So rather than lizards jumping off cliffs, it's more like this. First, you have relatively primitive amnios that are superficially lizard-like in their stance. Then you get more upright and more bipedal animals like Euparcaria at the base of Archosaurium. Then we get Ornithodirons like Lagosuchus that are on their way to being dinosaurs. Then we get to basal dinosaurs like Herrerasaurus. Then we get to basal tetanurin theropods like Allosaurus. Here we're getting a bit bird-like. These are animals with a furcula, the wishbone that you might remember from carving a roasted bird. Let's skip to Manoraptora, where we get to the semi-lunate carpal that allows birds to fold their wings in animals like Anzu. Then we get to animals like Anchiornis, which is almost a bird with the ability to glide on four wings and that was apparently living in trees, meaning that just like with many gliding animals today, such as flying squirrels, flying snakes, and flying frogs, this gliding was used to travel safely from tree to tree or from tree to ground and to avoid predators in the trees. Then we can look at Archaeopteryx, which is just bird-like enough that most people call it a bird, even though it has teeth, no beak, a long bony tail, and unfused wing fingers, unfused metacarpals, and no keel on its sternum. That's where I'll leave it for now as I've gone into even more detail many times on this channel, and please note that I have skipped dozens of named clades and scores of species that are significant to the story of the evolution of birds. So we go from quadruped to biped to having feathers to climbing to gliding to flying. None of this is well summarized as lizards leaping off of cliffs. The Bible says the Lord made the fish, and he made the birds, and he made... He actually kind of made creatures in order of their importance and complexity, making first the environment... Then he made the vegetation, and then he made all oh, people say, Pastor Doug. For the third time now, Doug, you were allowed to finish your sentences before moving on to new ones. In fact, it is still encouraged. God didn't even make the sun till the fourth day. That's one reason I don't believe in this long scheme where each of the days of creation were actually long epics of thousands or millions of years. God makes the vegetation on the third day, and he doesn't make the sun until the fourth day. Well, Pastor Doug... How do you have God saying, let there be light, if he didn't make the sun? Way to figure out one of the big problems with day-age old earth creationism. I don't care about that, so I'm skipping until he's done complaining about different flavors of creationism. Gets to day four, and he makes our galaxy, I believe, with the sun, the moon, and the stars. I believe there are many other galaxies that pre-exist our world. I believe there's life on other planets and other parts of the unfallen universe. See, this is technically something I said I would skip, but it's really interesting. Most Christians do not think of the fall as limited to just one area around Earth, and instead see the whole cosmos as fallen. You can see this in C.S. Lewis' space opera trilogy that starts with Paralandra. In this, humans visit various planets in the solar system, including Venus and Mars, to find aliens familiar with the basic outlines of the Western Christian take on the Christian religion, and who seem to believe in the incarnation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. They too must deal with sin and have a need for a savior like humans, and apparently they adopt Jesus as the savior. If we turn to Eastern Christianity, we can see a lot of the conception of the universe in the Pentecost icon common in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which depicts a figure at the bottom that is a personification of the cosmos. In fact, in icons in which the people depicted are labeled, this figure is labeled as cosmos. He is usually depicted as a sad king, sad because of the fallen nature of all reality, and a king because the cosmos retains the dignity that God gave it when he created the world. His hope is represented in the cloth he holds, carrying the twelve scrolls representing the teaching of the twelve apostles who spread Christianity. If we turn to the Bible in Romans 8.22, we read, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The idea that only part of the universe has fallen is very unusual in Christianity, to the point that I think Mr. Bachelor here is the first Christian I've ever heard advocate for it. It's strange to me the degree to which Dougie here takes opposite stances from other creationists while still falling under the broad umbrella of young earth creationism. I wonder what the likes of Ken Ham and Randy Galuza would think of him. As a side note, the Christian understanding of the fall, the effect of the sin of Adam on humanity, and the cosmos, and the nature of salvation is in fact quite diverse. Don't let evangelicals fool you into thinking that their ideas about it are just the default Christian position. I'm skipping ahead a bit until the next point that isn't just him explaining the basic order of creation as set down in Genesis, along with a harmonization of the contradictory accounts of Genesis 1 and 2. And so... God does all this as the crowning act of his creation, makes man in his image. That gives you some purpose in life, that you come from God, and we will, God himself will live with us. But you see, Doug, God isn't a scientific explanation, even if it's true. 
Science is about how the natural world operates in the absence of miracles. So simply saying that doesn't actually mean that science is about to stop checking in on those things, even if it's true that God created life or humans or whatever. We're going to go back to God. So don't be deceived by some of that uh, confusion. Yeah, there's similarities. And then there's the dating dilemma. This is so important. I've only got a few moments to talk about it. Oh, good. We're going to hear things that are wrong about radiometric dating. I can't say I'm surprised. Um, the whole evolutionary scheme rises or falls on the dating. Eh, I'll allow it. Since we cannot observe any spontaneous life happening, we cannot produce any spontaneous life happening anywhere in our world. Which doesn't matter since evolution is something that happens only once you already have life. If it could be demonstrated that life popped into existence after being created ex nihilo by the Christian God, that would do nothing to evolutionary biology at all. This is one of those things like late surviving non-avian dinosaurs. Even if it's true, it doesn't really help young earth creationism, although I suppose it would help theism, which late surviving dinosaurs would not do. In order for it to happen, the way that that's achieved is just say, we got millions of years. Uh, no, there's a whole interdisciplinary field called Origins of Life Research that in no way is simply relying on lots of time and then hand-waving everything else. They're conducting actual experiments in chemistry to see what possibilities there are for the origin of life. Now, there are ways off from actually having a working hypothesis, but they are certainly making progress, and they now have plausible abiotic ways to get basically all of the important building blocks needed for life to come into existence. Millions of years have gone by, but the dating methods they use, carbon-14 dating, radioisotope dating, they're all assuming that the environment is the same today as it was 6,000 years ago, and the Bible says it was radically different. Uh, no. Carbon dating literally has calibration curves, specifically because we know the conditions of the natural world are not constant. This is explained in literally the first result from Google for radiocarbon calibration, which is an article from Oxford University about how things like tree rings are used to help calibrate carbon dating curves, specifically because solar radiation varies over time, leading to more or less production of carbon-14. Let me read something to you from Compton's Encyclopedia. N14, or carbon-14, interacts with cosmic rays. Scientists believe that cosmic rays have been bombarding the atmosphere ever since the Earth was formed. They're believing it's constant. Well, if Doug has a way to stop the stars, the sun included from shining, which is what it would take to stop cosmic rays, then sure. But no, it's not believed to be constant. Hence why we have calibration curves. While the amount of nitrogen in the atmosphere has remained constant, they're assuming that. They don't know. No, that's not an assumption either. It's something that's checked. We have samples of paleoatmosphere in things like bubbles and amber and ice. And further, we know that there are no globally significant sources or sinks of nitrogen. So this is both theoretically well established, as well as directly measured. You'll notice that he doesn't seem to have a problem with us knowing that there was more or less oxygen at various times in Earth's past. But when it comes to nitrogen, oh no, that's too much. We can't figure that out. Okay, sure thing, Doug. Consequently, C14 or carbon-14 formation is thought to occur at a constant rate. It's not, though, except over small timescales, like centuries. Although the current ratio of C14 to other carbon atoms in the atmosphere is known, scientists are not certain that this ratio has been constant. I don't know how old that book is, but I'm pretty darn certain that it has not been, hence the calibration curves. Errors in radiocarbon dating can be caused by inaccurate radiation or particle counts, contamination of a sample with more modern carbon and stray radiation striking the counter. Using relative dating methods, scientists are able to distinguish which events occurred, but they're not always able to establish exactly when they occurred. Yep. Like all measurement methods in science, there are errors and no limitations. But let's look at other things in science. According to the Susan G. Komen Foundation, there is about a 7% chance in any given mammogram that a false positive will be recorded. This is a known problem with mammograms and is why we use other methods to confirm a breast cancer diagnosis. So should we just toss out mammograms because sometimes they say that someone who doesn't have cancer does have it? I would argue no, and point to the huge number of people whose lives have been saved by mammograms, and that I think most people would rather themselves or their loved ones have a scare or even an unnecessary treatment than just, you know, die. I think you can see why occasional false readings and limitations are not a good reason to simply abandon a measurement technique. You know how most of the dating, the ancient dating, is achieved? The ancients didn't do that much dating. I think it was mostly arranged marriages. You gotta listen carefully. They find a fossil within a certain strata at a certain depth in the Earth. Strata do not map directly to depth underground or height above sea level or something. 
This is like middle school earth science he's getting wrong here. And they say, because it was found at this depth, it must be this many thousands of years old. Nope. Strata are dated both relatively and absolutely. Relative dating just says X came before Y and after Z. Absolute dating actually gives numbers and units of time, like 5 million years ago, plus or minus 200,000 years. Relative dating relies heavily on the law of superposition. It says that in an undisturbed sedimentary sequence, the higher a stratum is, the younger it is, since you can't deposit new sediment under the ground. If the sequence has been disturbed, then you have to first determine which direction was up in that sequence before it was folded or tilted or what have you. Absolute dating usually cannot be done on sedimentary sequences, but instead relies on igneous rocks. That is a rock that came from a volcano. If the rock is extrusive, that is it formed on the surface, then it too is subject to the law of superposition and can be used to bracket the absolute date of sedimentary layers. For example, if you have a sedimentary stratum between an igneous rock that is 200 million years old and another one higher up that is 190 million years old, then you know the sediment was laid down sometime between 190 and 200 million years ago. Notice how at no time is a simple depth used to calculate this. Now, once this relative dating is well established with consistent sequences of sediment, index fossils can be used in the field as a quick way to determine the likely relative ages of rocks in the question in the areas that have not been so thoroughly surveyed. Usually, index fossils do not have the final word on the age of rocks, as that would be a bit circular. Well, how do you know that that depth is that many millions or thousands of years old? Because of the fossils we found there. No, because of the relative and absolute dating methods used to calculate that age. Index fossils are just a handy reference that are useful as a rough guide in the field. These are very ancient fossils, and we found them at that depth. That depth must represent a very long time ago. Well, how do you know that that depth is so ancient? It's still relative dating via the law of superposition and radiometric dating for absolute ages. Because of the fossils we found there. Saying a lie more than once doesn't make it true. And how do you know those fossils are so old? Because of how deep we found them. Saying a lie more than once doesn't make it true. That's what you call circular reasoning. That would indeed be circular, and it's why that's not how rocks are dated in real life, just in the cartoon version of science that some creationists carry around in their heads. It all depends on, is the radiocarbon-14 dating accurate? No, in fact, carbon dating is not used on rocks. It can only be used on once living matter. It can't even be used on permineralized fossils. Instead, things like uranium lead, argon argon, and potassium argon dating are used, which do not have the same problem with production rates as does carbon-14, because they do not depend on a certain starting ratio of radioactive nuclides to non-radioactive nuclides of the same element that depends on atmospheric conditions. Instead, they rely on relative ratios of daughter to parent that are based on chemistry, the same chemistry that lets people make plastic or designer drugs, and that relies on nuclear physics, the same physics that lets people make nuclear reactors and atomic bombs. Basically, unless most of physics is just flat wrong, these methods are valid. And they also cross-confirm each other routinely. Granted, there are anomalies, just like with mammograms, but just like with those, that's not sufficient to simply disregard them, especially when there are no observable anomalies, which is most of the time. They can only assume it's accurate based on what they test in the modern environment. No, in fact, its accuracy is routinely tested in oil exploration, where basin modeling is used to predict where to dig a new oil well. This is important because most oil companies are only a handful of dry wells away from complete bankruptcy, but also need new wells in order to keep themselves going. So how do they know where to dig? Well, as I said, basin modeling in which the age of rocks is a key aspect. Without that knowledge, digging for oil would basically be crapshoot. And like in crafts, you usually lose. Dating in these contexts is done just like it is in paleontology. First index fossils can give a rough guide to the age of the rocks in question, but once a promising location is located, in part through the use of index fossils, actual detailed analysis begins with both relative and absolute dating. If these things did not work, oil would not be reliably found via basin modeling. Yet it is. The existence of the petrochemical industry as it is now is prima facie evidence against young earth creationism. I got a candle on the screen there. Let me explain. Oh good, a Kenthoven classic. You walk into a room, you see a candle burning, you shut the door, and I say, how long was that candle burning? You'll say, well... Uh, let me measure how quickly I see it burn, and that might give me some idea about how long the candle was burning. But I say, no, wait a second. You don't know how tall it was when it started. Well, then, I'll look at how much dried wax has dripped from the candle and measure any taper the candle has. Combined with a burn rate, that will give me a plausible range for how long the candle could have been burned for. If the wax has been removed, then I know my necessary conditions for estimating total elapsed burn time have been violated. But that's something I can check for. So even though this example is specifically used to exaggerate how hard it is to assess starting conditions, it has actually failed at that. Furthermore, you don't know if it's burning at the same rate now as it was before you walked in the room. When you walked in the room, you may have changed how much oxygen was in the room. 
That's extremely unlikely, unless there's a very strange ventilation setup, which, you know, I could check for. There's so many variables that make it very difficult for you to know with a certainty how quickly that candle has been burning. That's a big part of the reason that all measurements have a margin of error. But if after taking all the variables into account, I come up with an answer of 20 minutes plus or minus 5 minutes, and you come by and tell me it's actually 1.6 milliseconds, which is the usual factor of difference between the measured age of the Earth and the young Earth creationist claims about the age of the Earth, I know for a fact you're full of and that's how it is with the Earth and creationism. There are certainly confounding factors in determining the age of things like rocks or the planet itself, but none of them allow for an error with a factor as great as 750,000, which is roughly what's needed for young Earth creationist claims to be plausible. That's the problem that they've got with the dating methods. A surmountable problem that leaves error margins, but still precludes young Earth creationism. Yep, I'll agree with that. Next slide, I want to show you something. A few years ago, they found a Tyrannosaurus rex thigh bone in Montana, and in the paleontologist in the laboratory, they cut with a very fine saw a cross section, stuck it under a microscope, and they gasped. Well, first, the story is wrong. There was a days long acid soak involved. Because here's the thing this soft tissue isn't soft when it's dug up, and even calling it tissue is a stretch. The acid bath was intended to remove the matrix, that is, the rock surrounding the fossils, and it was only supposed to last a few hours. Instead, samples were forgotten about for quite a while. And so after all that time, what was left was indeed soft and stretchy, but it wasn't before the acid. Now, I'm sure he's going to get more wrong, so let's see what happens. When they saw in this thigh bone, ostensibly 65 million years old, and eh, more like 68 million years, but what's a few million years between friends? Red blood cells and soft tissue. Nope, structures morphologically consistent with red blood cells, but that identification has not been confirmed to my knowledge. Further, this soft tissue is not the original structures. It is the remains of chemically altered tissues and proteins. It's analogous to the permineralization of the bone. When it's done, what you have is a rock in the shape of a bone, but not really the bone itself. This preservation was more direct, many of the atoms were the original ones, and many of the chemical bonds were as well. But many bonds have also been broken, some atoms lost, and others, especially iron, were introduced. These were molecular fossils, not the exact original chemistry of a living animal. They pulled a particle of the tissue apart, and this has not been produced by creationists, this is produced by the paleontologists. The lead paleontologist on this, one Dr. Mary Schweitzer, is in fact a former young earth creationist and a current Protestant Christian. They like to gloss over that fact. I don't. And they saw it was elastic. It still had resilience to it because it was so deep in a very large bone, it had not fully petrified. Nothing I can find in the paper by Schweitzer at all indicates that the femur of B. rex, the individual in question, was not fully permineralized. But then again, it doesn't say it was, so this is one of those things that might be true, but I don't think Doug could defend it. Then they started to dream about Jurassic Park. Could they extract DNA and start to inject it with a, an alligator or something to make a new modern dinosaur? They got very excited about that. I have literally never heard this claim even from other creationists, never mind from anyone actually working on this find. But then they realized, wow, we got a problem. We've been saying these creatures were extinct 65 million years ago. 66 million, but yeah, it was surprising that molecular fossils had been preserved for so long. Not because the dates were wrong, though. The scientists were presented with two basic possibilities. Maybe there is a new preservation mechanism that they don't know about, or all of nuclear physics, geology, astronomy, and biology was wrong, which is what it would take to fit this find into a young Earth creationist timeline. Unsurprisingly, they investigated the former option first and did so successfully, finding that iron cross-linking could preserve collagen and other protein decay products indefinitely, and also that some of what they found was simply extremely stable and unlikely to have decayed, such as heme decay-derived porphyrins. You go to your refrigerator after a million years. In this case, I'll assume that it's encased in sediment, full of dissolved iron, and in a largely anoxic underground kind of place. And you see how elastic things are. After like a two-month soak in acid, which happened in some cases in Schweitzer's research, I'm sure I could pull out some microscopic elastic bits, especially with all that iron and sediment and whatnot that I added to the thought experiment so that it's a reasonable analogy. Just a fridge on the surface of the planet probably wouldn't result in a fossil at all, so the whole thing is invalid the way Doug is framing it. That's why I refuse to play along with his straw man. This is not a good faith argument. You go to him after 10 million years. Do you know how long 65 million years is? I hope to find out someday. It's weird to me to ask someone if they know how long a time is when the time you give them has a unit of time on it. Like if I said, do you know how long the wait at the DMV is? That would make sense. But if I ask how long is 50 years, the only answer is 50 years. That doesn't change when the number gets bigger. It is fantasy science 
Well, I, for one, am really looking forward to Doug's correction paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society, which I'm sure is coming just any day now. Because again, unless he's got something to back him up on this, which if he did, he could publish, this is just incredulity. And all that shows is that Doug is either not interested in understanding the subject or is incapable of doing so. But what it doesn't mean is that anything is wrong with the science. To believe that these things have gone that long. And you know why? Why would some monkeys stop as monkeys? Whiplash topic change again. I should bill Doug if I need physical therapy for my strained neck muscles and bruised cervical discs. Anyway, no monkey ever stopped being a monkey. If by monkey we mean a population of monkeys and not individuals. I'll assume that's what we mean as it's being charitable, and I don't really think he means individual monkeys. If there's this somehow natural driving force to make creatures more intelligent and more sophisticated... Which there categorically is not. Selection is context-dependent, and being simpler and dumber can be favored just as being more complex and smarter. Why did some stop? As horseshoe crabs. I don't even understand this question. Horseshoe crabs are nowhere near the lineage leading to humans. The last common ancestor between horseshoe crabs and humans was probably little more than a tube with some muscles, and maybe some photosensitive skin, and maybe some bristles. It may not have even had a front end. I, for one, think it did not. But further, you can't just escape your taxonomy, because it's based on ancestor-descendant relationships. In order for that to happen, your descendants would have to be able to remove you as their ancestor, and that's just not how it works. Loathe as I normally am to bring up the man who became Chancellor of Germany on January 30th, 1933, the reason he doesn't have any descendants or even close relatives still living isn't because he was yeeted out of the family tree. It's because his relatives opted not to reproduce to kill anything that could reasonably be called his bloodline. That's the only way to get rid of an ancestor, to not have descendants anymore. But if you have descendants, then you're their ancestor, no matter how far into the future we go. Similarly, once a clade of organisms, that is, all the organisms with a shared common ancestor of that organism, is established, unless it goes extinct, it will always be around. And while new clades can develop within it, those clades will always be members of all earlier clades to which their ancestors belonged. Having horseshoe crabs stop being horseshoe crabs is logically impossible, and they remain as they are because they're good at making babies that then make babies that then make babies. That's all evolution really cares about. And even then, it doesn't really care because evolution isn't a person with motives. It's just a biological process that operates on the scale of populations. Why were they content to stay there? Why did some go into mammals and birds and, and turn into humans? Because species split and adapt to new niches and the environment changes. Also because mutations are stochastic and already separate lineages won't have the same mutations to work with for that reason. So they diverge morphologically, biochemically, and genetically. This is high school level evolutionary biology. Anyone who asks this question is in no position to criticize evolution because he simply doesn't know enough about what it is to even begin to formulate a valid critique. It's like someone who thinks they'll criticize Christianity by pointing to that one time Muhammad tortured a man to find his Jew gold, then killed him. Sure, that does seem pretty bad, but, um, you know, it's not part of Christianity. Yeah, sure, it does seem like if there were some metaphysical push to make everything like humans, that it sure would be odd how many non-human animals there are, but that idea just isn't part of evolutionary biology. Why do humans have 10%, only use about 10% of their brain in their life? They don't. They use essentially all of it. This is a cliche that has been known to be bullshit for decades. Why would we develop 80% we don't use? You didn't. Maybe we were meant to live longer. Maybe, but you sure can't argue that on the basis of the stupid and very wrong claim that humans don't use most of their brains. Why do fish live longer than us? There are certain pike. A bowhead whale can live 200 years. Whales are mammals. They're only fish in the strict cladistic sense that they're lobe fin fish, as are humans and all other tetrapods. But lifespans vary and are evolvable. If your best reproductive strategy is to have a huge number of offspring, then die like an octopus, then that's what selection will tend to produce. But if you're a mammal, it's often better to invest in each child more, to give it a better individual chance, and then live long enough to have a fair few kids. That's what most large mammals, like humans, whales, and elephants, and horses do. Can you imagine that? Yes, unlike Doug, apparently, I actually have a functioning imagination. It's not fair. Life's not fair, Cupcake. Cry about it if you like, but that won't fix it. There, there, it just does not make sense, friends. Fortunately for all of humanity, the litmus test for truth isn't just whatever still makes sense to the febrile mind of Doug Batchelor. If you want to know how old things are to do real science, you know how good scientists would measure, they would develop their theory, then they would go back 65 million years and say, sure enough, this is when it started. We have no way to go back in time and test the theory of timing that far back. Yes, literally the only way you can possibly know anything about the past in science is literal time travel. But how do we actually confirm this kind of thing? 
Well, one way is by checking predictions for molecular clocks against the ages of predicted transitional fossils that have been found, which themselves are cross-confirmed by multiple radiometric dating techniques. So, you know, checking multiple independent clocks. And when they all agree, it's either because we're right about the past, or because God is just a liar. And so, it is nothing but a theory. Theory is the highest level an idea in science can achieve. It's beyond law. It's beyond hypothesis. Other things that are nothing but a theory include the heliocentric model of the solar system, the germ theory of disease, and the oxygen theory of fire. I don't think Doug would like to say that he's not so sure about the fire triangle just because oxygen theory is just a theory. You're mocked if you're telling people that it's still a theory? No, you're not, because of course it's still a theory. That's kind of the end point. You're mocked for not knowing what a theory is. Those are very different things. They're, you're being told it's a fact because they're trying to remove God from the equation. Yep, all those evil atheists like Charles Lyell, Theodosius Dobzhansky, Mary Schweitzer, and Robert Bacher are scheming to get rid of God. Oh, wait, what's that? They all either are or were Christians? One of them is even a pastor? Oh, shoot, I guess that was just a straw man from Doug then, wasn't it? They're trying to get God out of the, um, the reality of uh, things existing. That sure was a string of words there. Let me give you one more, just a couple more thoughts here. I know I've gone a little over, but uh, I hope you don't mind. I kind of do, but whatever. Let's hear it, as long as it's not just preaching. One of the things they say, I'll tell you two more things. Light. When light comes from the sun, light travels 186,000 miles per second. Evolutionists will argue, they'll say, the light that we're looking at from the stars did not even leave the stars until millions of years ago. How can you say that it's only 6,000 years old? They forget the belly button effect. Ah, just jumping right into omphalism. Okay, so that's the idea that the universe isn't as old as it appears because God created it with an appearance of age. I'll have three points on this. Kepler's supernova was a type 1a supernova that occurred in 1604. The star that exploded was just under 20,000 light years away. So if God created the universe with all the light from distant stars on the way, that means he also created it with the light from an explosion that never happened. You know what it's called when you arrange everything to look like something that didn't happen did happen? That's called lying. This makes God a liar. Further, this idea is logically identical to last Thursdayism. Let's argue that the omnipotent God of the universe created the universe last Thursday, and every appearance of age, including all your memories, your age, all the evidence of past civilizations, etc., is just part of that appearance of age. How would that world be distinguishable from the one that actually had that apparent history? It wouldn't be. So it doesn't really make sense to talk about the real age of the Earth in this scenario. Finally, this inserts into your epistemological framework an omnipotent, omniscient deceiver, meaning that literally anything could be God tricking you, and there's no way to ever know anything because no conclusion about the external world could ever be justified. I think that's more than enough to curb stomp this nonsense. And so we're skipping the rest of his silly appearance of age a bit. Isn't it interesting that around the world, civilization suddenly sprang out of nowhere? No, because they didn't. There are archaeological pre-civilized antecedents to all the ancient civilizations. For example, the Egyptians that we know of from their own writing were preceded by the Marimde culture, the El Omari culture, and the Mahdi culture and many others. The Chinese civilization is preceded by the Neolithic Heiligang and Hemudu cultures. The Sumerian civilization was preceded by cultures such as the Hala, Husana, Samara, and Ubaid cultures. These Neolithic cultures are preceded by Mesolithic cultures, which are preceded by Paleolithic cultures. It is categorically untrue that civilizations simply pop up. They have continuity with the cultures before them, which were not civilized, by which I mean city building, which is the technical definition of a civilization. I do not mean that these cultures were dumb, brutish, or unsophisticated. They simply were not building cities, and they were not writing. You go back uh, 4,000 years, 5,000 years. And the Egyptians are into their civilized but pre-dynastic period. Cool. And you're seeing man has suddenly taken this leap, according to the anthropologist, from dragging his knuckles and stone tools to incredible sophistication and mathematical ability, where he's building these amazing monuments around the world. Not really. Gobekli Tepe is a stone structure complex from the pre-civilization era of 9,500 years ago. And it's a pretty darn impressive stone structure. The ability of humans to work in stone progresses, and the evidence of that progression is all over the archaeological record. You just have to look for it, rather than ignoring it because you want your flood account to be literally true. This is, of course, a great pyramid. I've been inside there. There on the right, you'll see that's called Nan Madal. They call it the Venice of the Pacific. It's an ancient civilization in Panape, which is thousands of miles from anything. They don't know how they move. Those stones are enormous. It is true that there is no consensus on how these stones were brought to Nan Madol, but they're not so big that simply rafting them is out of the question. It's more of a question of which of the techniques of several that we know were available were used, rather than not knowing any possible way to get the stones there. That being said, Nan Madol is really cool and more people should be aware of it. So after you're done watching my video for the day, I suggest you look it up.
Also, calling it ancient in the same breath you're talking about the pyramids is a bit dishonest. Construction of the city didn't really start until about the 8th century CE at the earliest, or about 1200 years ago, whereas the pyramids were made in the 2500s BCE, or more than 4,500 years ago. You know, before the flood of Noah, according to most creationists. Some of them, 50 tons. They don't know how the islanders move them. You ask the islanders, they don't know how it happened. They don't know, but they have folk tales. But also, what's the point of wondering this? Is some answer about how they got big rocks to some artificial islands in the 8th century really going to be evidence for or against the creation of the world 6,000 years ago? Or a global flood that didn't seem to bother the Egyptians? We're not getting more godlike. We started in the image of God. We're getting more monkey-like. Because he doesn't know how people move rock. Sure, I don't even feel the need to explain to you why people move big rock 1,200 years ago so people today monkey is a nonsense argument. It's called entropy. I'll just refer you to earlier in this series when I went into depth into what entropy is, and that will show you why this statement was dumb. Man used to live hundreds of years. There are no archaeological or biological data to support that claim. He was infinitely more uh, sophisticated and intelligent. Funny, then, how humanity is at its highest point of technological development. And that's not a counter to the fact that it seems odd that humans now have better technology than ever before, despite apparently being morons compared to the ancient Egyptians. We've been losing it. Now, I know we've gone through a thing with, with the technology. We're, we're having a surge right now. But, uh, you know, man's age for the last several thousand years has been three score and ten. And uh, Oh, fun. Another random topic change. Now, go back to the Glacier Girl. Let me tell you this story. Back in 1942, a squadron of six P-38 Lockheed aircraft were on their way to Germany. They needed to resupply planes for a battle in Europe. They got lost in bad weather. They ran out fuel circling around because they lost radio contact. They finally decided the only thing to do was to ditch. They ditched in the snow in, in uh, Greenland uh, on a glacier somewhere. Here is where, near Kogay Bay. Sorry for the pronunciation. Not really close to civilization, but also on the high precipitation coast not the low precipitation interior of the Greenland ice sheet. They all survived. One plane flipped over. All of the pilots, the first one had his wheels down when he came down. as bad. He flipped over, but he was only minor injuries. The others left their wheels up. They slid in. They landed. They were eventually rescued. Weather cleared. They got radio contact. They came in. They rescued them. The war went on. The planes got covered with snow. Some aviation enthusiasts years later said, it was on record, they said, we think we know where they went down. Those planes would be so valuable now because they were brand new P-38s. Let's go dig them up and find them. They spent years and millions of dollars, these were some rich aviation guys, finding the planes. They finally, using ground penetrating sonar, they found the planes 260 feet below the surface. Yup. And? Now, I'll tell you why this is important. Please, that would be lovely, because so far it seems completely unimportant to the question of whether or not evolution is the best explanation for biodiversity on the age of the Earth. A lot of... Uh, Evolutionists say we know how old the world is because we count the rings of ice. No, they don't. That's stupid. No one thinks that the Greenland ice sheet formed when the Earth did. We know it's older than 6,000 years because of the ice sheet, but we certainly didn't get to the 4.5 billion year estimate from frickin' ice cores. In the Arctic layers, and each one of those layers, those lines, represents a year. Yeah, they're taken from deep in the Greenland interior where it rarely snows, and there is basically no warming effect from ocean currents to cause extra melts or more precipitation. You know, exactly where the Lost Squadron in general, and Glacier Girl in particular, were not found. Fun fact, Greenland is not the size of a parking lot. It has a varied climate over the whole island. They found these planes down 20,000 years. No, they didn't, because no one is using coastal glaciers for dating. In the ice. Yes, the coastal ice that is known to form relatively fast because of the higher precipitation rate at the coasts. And they later came to discover those lines did not represent years, they represented snowstorms. No, they did not, because Doug has no idea what he's talking about at best, or is lying at worst. I don't know if he's lying, because he doesn't really have the background that would make me think there's no way he could be this stupid. I think in this case, we're probably dealing with someone who's mostly incompetent. In one year, you could have dozens of snowstorms in that environment, and then it would thaw a little bit, and you'd get a little line in it, and it would get cold again, and it would get warm again, and, and it left lines. You can see it in one winter on top of your car. On the coast of Greenland, yes, but not the interior. And of course, we can also cross-check with things like pollen. Plants in Greenland don't all just give off pollen all the time at the same time. So you can cross-check the annual nature of ice layers with pollen trapped in them to see if they really are annual. And for the ice cores taken for dating purposes, it turns out that yes, they are. For the layers from the coast, no, they're not. It's almost like the people who spent their whole lives doing nothing but becoming experts at this actually thought about how to check if they're right or not. And some idiot named Doug who doesn't know what he's talking about didn't actually think of something that never occurred to anyone before. 260 feet down. 
They recovered the planes. They got one of them. They got all the pieces of enough to make one plane. This is the restored plane. They call it the Great Glacier Girl, and it still flies around to air shows today. There's a lot of fantasy that has gone into what is being taught in the world. I don't believe most conspiracies. Well, he believes in Yarrow creationism, which is one big conspiracy theory, so I'm pressing X to doubt on his lack of proclivity for conspiracy theories. Except one. I bet if we drilled down far enough, it would be more than that. There is a very real conspiracy among the academia of the world today to push a counterfeit view of origin on the world as the only solution. If it's a conspiracy, it's a conspiracy to follow the evidence without relying on preconceived ideas based on old books. If the old books turn out to be right, which they sometimes do, then that's cool. But if they turn out to be wrong, then oh well, no amount of dog telling falsehoods is going to make all those Christians working in science suddenly actually be part of a vast satanic conspiracy to pretend that the world is as old as it is. National Geographic came out with a magazine that says, was Darwin right? Before they give any evidence, you open to the page of the article and it says, uh, was Darwin wrong? And the article says, no. Yeah, before they gave the evidence, they gave you the conclusion they'll come to. Then they gave the evidence. That's just structuring an article well. The article didn't just end there. Evolution is a fact. Yes, it is as much a fact as it's a fact that the sun is the center of the solar system or that germs can cause disease. They haven't even given any evidence. Yet. It's being taught as a fact, but when you really think about it, it's not logical, friends. That conclusion is not warranted by anything we've heard in this talk. I believe that there's some things we can't explain. No kidding, and just pretending that it means God did it doesn't actually make it so. Do we have a problem explaining things about God? A little bit. Where did God come from? I don't know. But you ask evolutionists, where did things come from? Well, world came from the sun when it exploded, and it was sent to hurling our solar system out into space, and... What? The Earth came out of the sun when it exploded? What the f*** is this guy smoking, and where can I get it? That is completely bonkers, and it's not something I've ever heard other creationists propose. Have we found a man stupider than Kent Hoven and Matt Powell? Do we need to recalibrate the Hoven scale of stupidity? Where'd our sun come from? Well, it came from a supernova out there in the universe when a star exploded. Where'd that star come from? Well, it came from gas particles that collided. Where'd that come from? Well, we... And eventually, you know what they're going to say? Stop acting like a four-year-old who just learned that you can always ask why, because eventually we're going to hit the edge of our knowledge about the past. But that doesn't mean that what we actually do know about it is just false. Just like if you see a car in the ditch and ice on the side of the road, you can probably know how the car entered the ditch, even if you don't know where the car was manufactured. And just like you can know how to bake a cake without knowing what chicken laid the eggs you're using. There's a mystery. We don't know where something came from. Now they say the Big Bang, get this, say the Big Bang was all the matter in the universe was somehow compressed to something the size of the head of a pin. No, it was just energy, and it was probably a lot smaller than that. How many of you heard that one? It exploded. No, space expanded rapidly, and an explosion is an expansion of matter within space. These are very different, even if they both involve expansion. Where did the pinhead of material come from? Energy. But, I don't know, maybe it was always there. Maybe it was some kind of quantum fluctuation. Maybe the infoton field is real. And that's where. Maybe God put it there. Not knowing that doesn't negate the knowledge of later history of the universe that science has accumulated. Either way, you're going to come to one of two choices. You can believe all the beauty and all the organization and all the wonders and all the inner working design and all the symmetry and all the math and the healing and the symbiotic relationships in the world around us today all came from a pinhead that exploded or there is an intelligent God and we don't know where he came from because he is from everlasting to everlasting. You can believe in both. Most theists do. And that means if there is a God and he did make things the way he says in the Bible, well, if there's a God, he definitely didn't make things the way Doug thinks. Well, the rest of this is just a bit of preaching. Well, if you enjoyed this video, hit like and tell me in the comments. If you didn't, feel free to hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Either way, please remember to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're always notified when I have more content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I just want to say a special thank you to my channel members and my patrons, especially those pledging $20 or above. Benthoven, Tapioca Weasel, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Phil Havala, Ian Chen, Kelvin Brostick Van Manen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, Monkey They Them, Mrs. Spexander, San, Sphincter of Doom, and the Venerable Bead. As you probably know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and from month to month, my income on the channel can swing wildly. But the people you see on screen are directly supporting, so that I don't have to worry too much about that, and the channel can keep going as it is, and perhaps even improving.
If you'd like to join this team, there are links below to join the channel or in the description to join the Patreon. The Patreon starts as low as $1 a month, and the channel memberships start as low as $1.99 a month. On Patreon, you can even get a discount for pledging annually. If you do decide to pledge, you'll get access to an exclusive Discord server just for channel supporters. And either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos, often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Now, if an annual or monthly pledge isn't right for you, but you still want to support the channel, there is a merch store down in the description, as well as an Amazon wishlist, just for me. And if financial support isn't something you can or want to do, then if you still want to help out the channel, please just like and share these videos and make sure you comment on them. It really helps the channel out. Thanks again for watching.